All right. You can take out your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 10. As we continue our series in this, in the books of First and Second Kings, it's always encouraging to see the Lord building His church. Uh, he He saves sinners. He makes us brothers and sisters. Uh, for our guests, my name is Steve Heitland. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we are very glad that you've joined us, uh, especially on this Sunday. It's such a great Sunday to be able to have a meal together, to fellowship, to get to know folks a little bit, to run if you want to run. Uh, and it looks like a beautiful day. Um, and there's an army of folks downstairs serving you, getting ready uh, for this meal. Uh, I did want to update our members on our senior pastor, Peter. Uh, he is actually in the hospital this morning. Uh, last Sunday after, actually during the sermon, he was not feeling well. Uh, he's not felt well all week. They did finally get clarity that he has... Uh, what did they call it? A collection of infections in his ankle where he had had his surgery for his uh, ruptured Achilles. Uh, so he's in the hospital getting treatment. Uh, it's likely he's going to have a surgery this morning to remove that infection. Um, now, thankfully, they've tested his heart because of his heart surgery. That Those results have come back uh, negative, which is good. That's the confusing medical terminology. Um, but as you know, they, they have been through it. Um, one thing after another. So we're going to pray for him in a moment and, of course, ask you to continue to keep the privateers in your prayers uh, in the days ahead. So let's pray as we prepare to turn to God's word. Father, we are all fragile and weak. You are the one who created and sustains us. You're the one who gives us breath. You give us rest. When we wake in the morning, it is a gift of your grace. You hold us together. And that is both humbling and encouraging because we know your personal providential care as our Father. And Father, we know that you are with Peter and Grace and their girls, their family that you are even right now upholding and sustaining him. Uh, we pray that you would comfort and encourage them, that you would strengthen their faith, their hope, their rest in you. And we pray that you would heal him, that all the infection would be removed, that he would uh, regain strength and mobility and uh, to be able to do all that you've called him to do as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a son. Father, please, in your mercy, in your power and kindness, uh, bring our brother back to us here to join us, to rejoice, to be part of this people that he loves so well. And Father, we also pray as we turn to your word, as we consider the life of Solomon, that you would work in our hearts. Your word is truth, and we desperately need truth. We need the truth of your word to affect our thoughts, our affections, our commitments, to, to sanctify us, to comfort us, to encourage us. You know exhaustively the condition of every heart here. You know what every heart needs to know and love and trust you, to, to live for your glory. And so we pray, please work by your spirit in our hearts for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we've arrived at a crucial moment in the history of the nation of Israel as we come to 1 Kings 10. The, the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings record the rise, and as we're going to see this morning, the fall of the glory of Israel under the rule of King Solomon. Solomon, of course, is one of the most famous persons in the Bible. Even non-Jewish and non-Christian people around the world know of Solomon the wise. And under him, Israel experienced unprecedented, almost unimaginable peace and prosperity. 
Israel was a very great nation at this point because the Lord had blessed and established them, and Solomon was their king. But history is filled with great nations and great empires. Some rulers even have great appended to their names, like Alexander the Great. Right? He, he extended the kingdom of Greece into Asia and North Africa, or Charlemagne, which just translates Charles the Great. He, he ruled over much of Europe. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. But there's one thing that, that these great rulers all have in common. They're all dead. And there's one thing their empires all have in common. They're all gone. History is the record of the rise and the fall of great powers. We can, we should be impressed by the, the grandeur of their accomplishments, but we should also be humbled by their eventual and inevitable failures. There is only one king, and there's only one kingdom that has endured and that will endure through all time, and that is the kingdom of God. His reign is total and unrivaled. It extends over all of creation, over things seen and unseen. It extends over all time. The Bible calls Almighty God the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He rules over them. He rules over all of us. We are all his subjects. And so today as we look at 1 Kings 10 to 11, we will see the height, the very pinnacle of the earthly power of the kingdom of Israel. And we'll, we'll behold a description of Solomon's splendor that honestly is hard to fathom. It's hard to process. It, it's truly magnificent. But then the story will turn very suddenly and expose that there was a hollowness within Solomon's kingdom. We're going to gain insight into the idolatries that Solomon harbored in his heart. And we'll hear what the Lord thinks about Solomon. What's the Lord's verdict of Solomon? These chapters are a sober, cautionary tale, and they offer us a message of both blessing if we listen and respond humbly, and judgment if we stiffen our necks in pride and selfishness. So here is the message of 1 Kings chapter 10 and 11 for us today. Love the Lord from your heart, or you will face the ruin of his anger. Love the Lord from your heart or you will face the ruin of his anger. And so we're going to unpack this story in two main plot points with a, a number of subpoints. The first point is the wonders of his love. That's chapter 10, the wonders of his love. So let's read 1 Kings 10, verses 1 to 10. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report that I have heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king, that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In order to appreciate this story, we need to understand a bit of who the Queen of Sheba was and what her journey represents. She was the Arab queen of a powerful kingdom in what was probably now known as the Kingdom of Yemen. So she made a journey of over a thousand miles across the desert on camel to visit King Solomon. 
Consider that. There was no, obviously, there's no internet, there's no television, there's no mass modern communication, no instantaneous news. News traveled primarily by foot, whether human foot or animal foot. And so this queen of a distant land hears tales of a very great king. And she's so enraptured by this news that she has to come and see for herself. And she's compelled to make this long, arduous journey to find out if the tales were true. And what she finds is that she had not been told the half of it. Look at how expansive the language is in verses 2 and 3. When she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind, all of it. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. Every question she had, no matter its difficulty, he was able to answer her. Truly, she was dealing with Solomon the wise. It's like a little child with a parent, right? My kids think I know the answers to everything, right? They they marvel at the wisdom of dad until they get old enough. Uh, But this this was truly nothing, nothing she could ask that he couldn't answer. Imagine what that would be like. And not only was he Solomon the wise, but he was also Solomon the magnificent, as seen in the grandeur of his food, of his house, of his servants, of of the entirety of his royal court. And the response that it elicits from her is palpable, right? Verse 5, there was no more breath in her. The royal court of Solomon was literally breathtaking, right? That's a word that's overused, but, but here it is literally true. It is literally breathtaking. And it's taking the breath not of a commoner who you would think would be impressed, but of a queen, who's used used to the the perks of royalty. And here's where we see the the humility of the queen of Sheba and her wisdom. Because though she had some doubts about the reports as she heard them in her land, she had been humble enough to make the journey and to find out for herself. And when she witnessed the truth with her own eyes, she didn't respond in pride. She responded rightly. She, She praised Solomon. She celebrated the blessing of his kingdom. And most importantly, she drew out the lesson that all of these incredible blessings represent. There is a God behind all of this. And he is the one to be praised. We see her testimony here and it concludes in verse 9. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. This is a humble heart, recognizing the goodness of the Lord in the blessing of Israel. And so she praises the Lord and she gives Solomon very great presence in response. The Queen of Sheba is an intriguing figure in the Bible because she only appears in a few verses here, but this isn't the last that we hear of her in scripture. It may well be that she came to saving faith in the God of Israel through this journey. Jesus seems to imply that when he's encountering the unbelief of the Pharisees and he's critiquing them in Matthew 12. He says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Sheba came for the wisdom of Solomon and discovered the God who was underneath it and behind it. When that God came to the earth and and walked as a man a thousand years later, the leaders of that day rejected him. That's why the queen of Sheba will rise and condemn them on the day of judgment. And that is the first application for us this morning. We should certainly marvel at the grandeur of Solomon's kingdom. And we're soon going to hear more about how grand and glorious it was. But we must also realize that even very great kingdom, that very great kingdom pales in comparison to the kingdom of God, to the glory and the grandeur of his great reign. Solomon was a type of Christ. He was a pointer to Christ. And and so he points forward beyond himself to the truly great king. And so in that, we are all summoned to come and to worship that great king, as the Queen of Sheba did. That's the proper response to this kind of immense blessing. 
Verse 11 then begins to unfold more of the glory of Solomon. We already saw that the Queen of Sheba gave him these immense gifts, including these spices that were never equaled again in the kingdom. And here we also read that he received gold and precious stones and, and, and very rare almond wood that was used in the temple and used to make instruments for the singers. And in verse 14, we start to get an account of the quantity of gold that Solomon was dealing with. It says that he received 666 talents in one year. Now, a talent is around 75 pounds. And so that equals somewhere between 20 and 25 tons of gold in one year. And that doesn't include the, the foreign business transactions that he was benefiting from. That is unimaginable wealth. 20 tons of gold in a year. And, and you can see how vast that quantity is in two other pointers in the text. First is you see it in the relative worth of silver. And so the text says that silver is not even considered valuable in Jerusalem at this time in verse 21. And it's as common as stones in verse 27. That's impressive that silver, silver is so uh, debased in value. And then second, you see that Solomon uses this gold to create hundreds of massive gold shields, 300 gold shields that line the walls of the hall. He uses the gold to overlay this, this um, throne that he creates, this magnificent throne overlaid in gold. He even uses gold to make his drinking vessels. It's just this unbelievable quantity of gold, this unimaginable wealth. And so in verse 23, the author gives us his verdict, his assessment of where Solomon stands. He says, thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present Articles of silver and gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. Solomon is a truly legendary king, ruling over a world-renowned kingdom. So what are we to make of all this wealth and this fame? I think the text gives us a mixed verdict. On the positive side, wealth and fame can be a sign of the Lord's blessing. It's the fulfillment of his promise. And so we saw a couple chapters ago in 1 Kings 8, uh, beginning in verse 41, there was a promise that the nations would be drawn to Israel, right? That requires fame. It requires a word to go forth so that they would be drawn to this nation to hear of the God of Israel. And Proverbs 10, 22 links prosperity to obedience to the Lord. It says, the blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. So in this way, the, the rule of King Solomon is again a picture of, of the superabundance of the blessing and goodness of God and the grandeur of his kingdom. Our Lord is generous and exceedingly good. There, there's never a shortage. There's no supply chain problems in God's kingdom. His table is always richly furnished. He has an abundance of good. Yet there are also some negative indicators in the text. They're not the emphasis of this chapter, but they, they're almost these gathering storm clouds to warn us that danger is coming. Uh, earlier in Scripture, the Lord repeatedly warned Israel and warned the kings to not accumulate wealth and might and power because that would create a sense of independence from the Lord. He explicitly commands kings to not accrue military power uh, to, because then they would be setting themselves as a rival to his rule over his people. And we see that especially in Deuteronomy 17. I'm going to read these verses at length and, and uh, compare these verses to what we just saw of Solomon. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself, or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. 
nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children, in Israel. So what we're seeing here is Solomon in the process of violating every one of these commandments. Wealth and fame can be a blessing, but they so easily become a means of self-promotion and self-reliance that they lure us away from wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Many of our Old Testament heroes were fabulously wealthy. They were immensely wealthy. And the Bible does not have a negative assessment of wealth. But it does offer us great cautions. We must see any blessing in our lives as coming ultimately from the hand of God and not from our industry or our wisdom or our abilities. They come from the hand of God. And then we must use those things as he commands, which means especially to be generous as he is generous. And you can go to 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 17, and see that command to God's people. Solomon, though, accumulates great wealth. He forms an alliance with Egypt. He married, in chapter 3, you'll remember, he married the princess of Egypt. He, uh, he's actually serving as a kind of Middle Eastern arms dealer because he, he's importing horses and chariots and then selling them to the surrounding nations at great profit. So there's a, a number of gathering storm clouds on the horizon. Things seem to be going very well from an external standpoint. But danger is lurking. And as we're about to see, the story is going to turn much, much darker. So we need to pay attention. We need to learn the lesson that the Lord is teaching us. We need to love the Lord from our heart or we will face the ruin of his anger. And that brings us to our second point, which is the woes of his anger. This is chapter 11. So let's read verses 1 to 8 of chapter 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. Verse 1 is one of the most tragic verses in Scripture. In 1 Kings 3, we had read that Solomon loved the Lord. That's 1 Kings 3.3. 3. And here, eight chapters later, a reading of another love. We, we just read this amazing extended account of the blessing that the Lord had poured out on Israel. But here we discover there's termites in the woodwork. It says, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. His offense is in violating the explicit command of the Lord to not marry foreign women because they would bring their foreign gods and those gods would lead his heart astray. They would turn the hearts of the people of Israel astray. You see those warnings in Deuteronomy 7 and Exodus 34. And this, of course, would especially apply to kings who were responsible to defend the nation and to serve as an example of faithfulness to God. 
We read that his 700 wives were princesses, which is probably a pointer to the reality that, that many of these were political alliances, right? You marry the, the princess and, and you have cozy relations with that nation then. You don't have to worry about them attacking you. Plus 300 concubines, right? So 1,000 in total. And so the wealth and fame of Solomon are immense, but so is his sin. Verses 3 to 8 told us how his wives turned away his heart. It says twice that his wives turned away his heart. He, he builds temples. He builds high places for these foreign gods. And his wives make offerings and sacrifices there. He, Solomon has brought tremendous evil into the very heart of the nation of Israel. And there's another tragic note here. I wonder if you caught it. At the beginning of verse 4 it says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart. Right? He, he clung to these wives in love. And five times in these verses, the word heart is mentioned. And, and heart, it so often functions in Scripture, not like we use it. When we say heart, we tend to mean emotion, affection. But the Bible uses the heart to mean the entirety of your control center. So your thoughts, your affections, your will, your choices, your commitments. Right? The entirety of his motivating center was turned away from the Lord. But what's tragic is that it didn't happen in one moment. Commentator Dale Ralph Davis helps us. He says, this infidelity is subtle because it's gradual. Verse 4 has a scary line. When Solomon was old, his wives had turned away his heart after other gods. It was not some sudden attack or irresistible assault that explains Solomon's plunge into pagan ecumenism. No, it took years the result of the creeping pace of accumulated compromises, the fruit of a conscience desensitized by repeated permissiveness. So over the years, as Solomon added wives and concubines, he also added their idols into his household. He wasn't fulfilling his royal duty to defend the nation from foreign gods. He was welcoming them right into the heart of the most important family in the entire kingdom. And it was years and years and years of accumulated compromises that led his heart away from the Lord in his old age. Solomon the wise ended his life worshiping foreign gods. The worship of many gods is exceedingly common in human history. It's probably fair to say that most people who've ever lived have worshiped many gods. There are gods and goddesses of everything, right? Of business and of health and of fertility and, and of everything you can think of, of love. Prayers have been offered and gifts are given. Even right now, prayers are being offered and gifts are being given to gods and goddesses, entreating them to give the blessing that the worshiper desires. What had made Israel truly exceptional was their singular devotion to the one true God. And that God demands that kind of devotion. It is indeed the first commandment from Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The Lord our God is a jealous God, verse 5 tells us, and he brooks no rival. And so this isn't like human jealousy where we just vainly want praise for ourselves. This is divine jealousy. It requires our wholehearted commitment because God is good. The Lord requires our love and devotion because he's the only one who is ultimately worthy of it. He requires our wholehearted devotion because he's made us for himself. And so our good and our flourishing is found in our wholehearted devotion to him and only to him. This is one of the things that the selfish heart finds so difficult to understand. We want to act as though we can pick and choose. Well, I'll be obey that one, but I, that one seems kind of outdated or oppressive, right? I don't like that. I can explain that away, but that, that sounds good to me, right? We set ourselves up as the arbiters of what obedience to the Lord is. He does not leave us that option. Again, the Elder Ralph Davis writes, Yahweh is unique among ancient Near Eastern gods, goddesses and godlets no pagan deity demanded exclusive devotion 
of his or her worshipers. And the anger of the biblical Yahweh bothers contemporary man because it clearly tells him that the God of the Bible is not a pluralist. He does not fit our times and mentality. The Lord is angry with Solomon. The Lord is angry with unbelief and idolatry because he is good. Were he not angry, he would be diminishing his glory and his goodness. Were he not angry, he would be withholding the greatest good that he can give to anyone, which is himself. The Lord is angry at idolatry because it robs him of his glory. And he's angry of, his, of, his, of idolatry because it robs us of the good that comes only in him. So now we're going to turn and see how the Lord's anger unfolds against Solomon. In uh, Let's read verses 9 to 13. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. This is a devastating judgment. The Lord had promised David that he would have a man on the throne forever. And here David's son is experiencing the the rending of the kingdom. The Lord is announcing to Solomon, even at the height of his powers and his wealth, as Israel appears to be just the most flourishing that they could be, that his reign would be the end of Israel as a nation. As soon as Solomon dies, Israel is done. The union of these 12 tribes is done. Ten would be split to form the northern nation and what will now be known as Israel, and two would be left to form the nation of Judah. That would be Judah and Benjamin. And that split and its aftermath are are what we're going to see for the rest of our time in 1 and 2 Kings. Yet even in the midst of this judgment, there is mercy. The Lord is faithful to his promise. He says, for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. So he doesn't take the entire kingdom away from Solomon's descendants. He had made a promise to David. And that promise was always going to be ultimately about the grace and mercy and patience and faithfulness of the Lord. If if God's blessings in our lives are ultimately conditioned on our obedience, we're doomed. Right? But it's because he is rich in mercy and great in love that we have hope. He, He offers many, many opportunities for us to turn to him in faith and to repent of idolatry. So we don't want to forget that note. Because even in the midst of judgment, there is mercy. There's a promise that God's purposes are not finished yet. But we do need to look at the judgment of the Lord. Verse 14 tells us, And the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the royal house in Edom. Now the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. Right? Jacob and Esau. And so they were cousins to Israel, as it were, and they, uh, they hated each other, understandably, given the conflict that had gone down, and they lived to the, the south of Israel. So there's bad blood with their neighbors to their south. And, and, and not many years previously, Joab had crushed the Edom, Edomites in battle, and he killed off their entire royal, royal family, except for Hadad, who had escaped to Egypt. And as he's there, he has a son named, that he names Jenubath, which comes from the verb for to steal. Right? My, my kingdom has been stolen from me. And so the Lord raises him up as Solomon's first adversary. And then in verse 23, it also tells us, God ra- also raised up an adversary to him, Rezon, the son of Elida, who had fled from his master, had a desert king of Zobah. So he comes from the north. And he, it says he's an adversary all the days of Solomon, doing harm as Hadad did. He loathed Israel. So here we have two adversaries that the Lord has raised up, one from the north and one from the south. And he's opposing Solomon because of his idolatry. But of course, he's not just opposing Solomon, because Solomon's the king. 
And so the entire nation is being affected by the idolatry of Solomon. Verse 26 then introduces another adversary. And it doesn't explicitly state here that the Lord raised him up, but you see through the narrative that that, that's exactly what's going on. Jeroboam is one of Solomon's servants, and he becomes an enemy from within the kingdom. He's, He's a very capable man, and Solomon had promoted him. He put him in charge of all the forced labor in verse 28. And in verse 29, Jeroboam leaves Jerusalem, and he just happens to bump into a prophet of the Lord, Ahijah. And Ahijah is wearing a new garment, and he takes it off, and he tears it into 12 pieces. And he says to Jeroboam, you take 10 pieces for yourself, because the Lord's giving you 10 tribes, but, but he's reserving two for Solomon's son. And so, the, again, the message is very explicit. The Lord is rending the nation of Israel because of the infidelity of Solomon. But the Lord also makes an astounding offer to Jeroboam. If Jeroboam would listen to the Lord and obey him, as David did, the Lord will build a house for Jeroboam as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. You have to understand, Jeroboam had no rightful claim to the throne of Israel. He was not a son. He wasn't a descendant of David. So he had no rightful claim by birth, but the Lord is offering him to have a house built like he did for David, a a lasting house, a legacy. He would have a legitimate rule if he would obey the Lord. Chapter 11 doesn't tell us how that winds up. You'll have to wait for next week. But we do find Solomon's reaction in verse 40. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So Solomon has an enemy from the north, He has an enemy from the south, and he has an enemy within. Even in the might and magnificence of of all of his splendor, of the height of his powers, none of that could protect him from the anger of the Lord and from his judgment. And that leads us to the end of Solomon's reign, which is a whimpering end. So let's read verses 41 to 43. Now, the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. Having read chapter 10, is this how you would expect Solomon's reign to end? Is this the summary of his life that you would anticipate? There there are two positive notes here, right? He ruled 40 years, that's a long time, and he was wise. So it recognizes those two positive things. But then it just says he died, he was buried, and his son took the throne. There's no mention of the magnificence. Solomon does not go out on a high note. There's no mention of a massive state funeral with with uh, dignitaries from all over, no mention of his wealth and his, his power, his, his majesty, the, the things he had accomplished, none of that is mentioned. He's dead. His life is over. And the split of Israel is imminent. This is a truly tragic end to one of the most accomplished characters in all of the Bible, really in all of history. Solomon is one of the most accomplished men in all of world history. And he just kind of putters out at the end. Ask Doug to come up. And ushers, you can come up and start distributing the elements for the Lord's Supper, please. Well, the conclusion from this text is clear. The accumulated achievements of a lifetime, the the praise and wonder of all those dignitaries, all their gifts, uh, none of that matters in the light of the verdict of the Lord. The Lord is not impressed by our accomplishments. His justice is not swayed. He is the perfect and righteous judge. His assessments are always pure. They are always true. And Solomon himself bears witness to this at the very end of his most famous book of wisdom, which is the book of Ecclesiastes. Here are the final wise words of Solomon. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. 
Fear God and keep his commandments. Love him with your whole heart. Serve him in obedience. To to do that is life itself. And to fail to do that, to fail to love and obey the Lord, is to incur his anger. It's to be awaiting a fearsome judgment. Now, were any of us to stand before the Lord on the basis of our works, on the basis of all that we have done, Were were the fruits of our lives to be the the grounds, the means of his assessment, his verdict of us, all hope would truly be lost. But there is a king more wise and more magnificent than Solomon. And his life is the epitome of wholehearted devotion to the Lord. He, He never strayed. He never stumbled. He never failed. And when he was sent to death by the hands of wicked and willful men, the torment that he endured was unjust and undeserved. But he endured it willingly. He endured it with joy so that everyone who trusts in him would find that their own record of rebellion against the king has been pardoned. They would find that they have been granted his perfect record of righteousness. Jesus is that king, and he holds out mercy and grace to us all. He interposed his righteous blood so that instead of receiving the just anger of God, the anger that we deserve, the anger that we've earned, that we've incurred, we could receive instead his just welcome and reward. If we truly want to fear God and keep his commandments, we do that first and foremost by trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, for the gift of his perfect righteousness. And only then, after we've been transformed by his grace, but we've been made spiritually alive, we've been given new hearts and new minds, then we become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which we've been committed, Paul writes in Romans 6. We obey because he's loved us, he's saved us, he's transformed us. So don't stiffen your neck in pride. Don't sag your shoulders in despair. Bow your knee in humble worship to the true king, to the true savior. The king who lived and died and rose again. The king who ascended to the heavens and sits at the right hand of Almighty God, where he lives to intercede for his people. The king who poured out his spirit on us. That's the way to love the Lord from your heart. And then you will not face the ruin of his anger. Let's pray.